That was awesome. So thank you. Um, and no turning back. No turning back. I appreciate that we did things a little bit different today. Uh, I think that sometimes we can become a little too religious, a little too ritualistic. You know, oh, this is our order. It's always the same order. We, we, we always do it that way. What, what do you mean? And we need to be free enough to allow the Holy Spirit to move too. We can't be so rigid. And uh, so it's good to do things a little bit different once in a while. And uh, so that's awesome. And that's kind of uh, leads in super well to today's topic because... Um, Sometimes we can become too uh, too rigid in enforcing our habits. We, you know, there are things we do, and we always do them the same way, and that's just the way it is. Um, I know that when I get into the car, one of the first things I do, well, I'm going to say because my wife's here, is put my seatbelt on, <laughs> which is... You know, one of the first things I do normally. Um, but one of the things I, I kind of get into a habit of is turning on the music. You know, I need to prepare myself for the journey. So I put some music on and I hit the road. Now, the same is true with the motorcycle. Because my motorcycle has, you know, four loudspeakers. But uh, even more so, I have a full face helmet with a Bluetooth connection to my phone so I can listen to music, make phone calls, do all that stuff while adhering to the speed limit. Um, so, but I get into this habit of when I get in the car, I turn on the music. It's just normal. It's my routine. So recently my wife asked me, do you always put the music on? Always? And I paused and I thought about it and I'm like, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. That's part of my routine. And she shared with me that lately the Lord's been really putting on her heart not to put the music on and just be still and listen. Embrace the quiet. Now, that's kind of resonated with me, and I have not been turning the music on as much uh, and I just enjoy the ride and listen and try to be still sometimes music you know music itself is not a bad thing I'm not saying woe unto you music listeners music can be a joyful thing it can be an uplifting and encouraging thing uh, on long rides when uh, I'm tired, I really enjoy some high decibel music. It helps keep me awake. So music in itself is not a bad thing, but I need to be careful that music doesn't become an obstacle, a distraction, a veil between me and hearing the voice of God. So many, we talk to so many people and it's not uncommon for somebody to say, I don't think I've ever really heard the voice of God. And I think from now on, I'm going to have to ask the question, how actively do you listen? How quiet do you get to hear? Or are you constantly trying to keep yourself busy and entertained and distracted that even when he's screaming in your ear, you may not hear him? So again, music in itself is not a bad thing, but you know we can get into that ritual of making it part of our thing. Uh, similarly, we, we talked about food recently, and food in itself is a good thing. You need food. It's part of life. Uh, but food, too, can be something of a distraction. It's a necessity, but we can also use it to be something that can be abused, you know, taken advantage of. Uh, we often will use food not for the nutrition, but for the pleasure of it. You know, we're, we're more interested into the tantalizing taste than we are in you know, the healthiness of it. And um, we have an expression in our household, uh, an expression that I'm not the one that usually says it, but it's there. Uh, and the expression is eating your feelings. Are you eating your feelings? You know, are you eating because you're bored? 
are you eating because you're sad, because you're hurt, because you're, I don't know, why are you eating? Because you just ate. And usually I have a hard time answering that question because, you know, I might be eating my feelings. You know, sometimes it's more about enjoying the pleasure of the endorphins of the sugar and flavors than it is about what we're actually trying to accomplish, and that's nutrition to our body. Um, we can use the eating the feelings thing, you know, in, in common discussions, like, how bad was that breakup? Oh, that breakup was two pints in a candy bar bad. It was really bad, you know, because we eat our feelings. Um, so my, my wife watches a lot of YouTubers. I watch a lot of YouTubers too, and we we do watch some of the same, you know, Christian scriptural, you know, uh, discovering uh, channels. But then we, you know, diverge in our interests. Where I'll watch like firearms reviews and paintball stuff. She likes to watch things on uh, sociology and relationship building. You know, uh, some of the things she looks at are videos on exercise and you know fitness and she'll share them with me so I can you know improve my form and maybe try different exercises um, but she watches a lot on nutrition too which is very helpful because she shares that information with me as well just this week she was talking about a couple and um, I think it was a couple and they're kind of committed to eating the same boring tasteless foods over and over and over again because they want to remain focused on the fact that they're eating for nutrition and not for pleasure and so they don't flavor it now I'm not saying that it's a sin to slather something in just heaps of butter and garlic that is not a sin unless you have cholesterol issues and health issues but um, but I can appreciate the fact that if for them food has been you know a real struggle something that they've been battling with and their solution is to you know put it in a box and contain it and say I'm we're just eating to sustain ourselves and for the health of our bodies then praise God if that's what they want to do then let them do that we need to be aware of the things in our lives that maybe have a little bit too much influence and control over us that we need to also put in a box or just sit down and walk away from. So these are two things that I've struggled with, you know, um, food, because I like food, and um, the music thing, you know, and just being still and listening. And so I'm working on them, you know, since we've been talking about it, these are things that I continue to work on. And that leads into our topic. Do we have the slides? I can just see your smiling eyes over the screen. I like it. Um, so today we're going to be reading from Joshua 24, uh, the first two verses, and then we're going to jump uh, to 14. So please follow along with me. This is the NIV, and it says, Then Joshua assembled all of the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your ancestors, including Terah and the, fa the father of Abraham and Nahor, uh, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. And then jumping down to 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your that your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites uh, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord, uh, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt for, from the land of slavery and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us 
uh, on our, our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all, our, all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Let's open a prayer. Father God, you are our God. You are the light, the only light. You are the only source of life and love and hope and joy and salvation. You are the only gateway to eternal fulfillment in your presence. So we just ask that you would continue to have these lessons change us change our actions, change our behavior, make us aware of the things that we need to shine your spotlight of truth on so that you can then mold them and we can become more like you, that your light would shine brighter in us to the world around. Just pray that you bless this message, bless those here, bless all those that here to have your ears to hear and understand. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it says in 14, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods that your ancestors worshipped. And so I do have the definition of worship on here because I always know what I think worship means, but when you look at the actual Hebrew word, it says to work in any sense. By implication to serve, till, and slave. What? What? Be kept in bondage. Be bondmen, bond service, compel. It goes on to say to keep labor, um, serving, servant, service. Work and worship. So basically, there's a degree of control. To worship is to allow control, to submit control to whatever it is you're worshiping. And so pondering on this, I'm thinking, wow, what else has control over me? What else have I released control of my life to impact it? And in being honest, I can be controlled by my phone sometimes. You know, if I've got two minutes to rub together, I find myself looking at my phone. What's the world got to tell me? Who's trying to reach out to me? You know, who's posted what video? What's, you know, anything going on in the news? And I can become kind of a servant of my phone. And it's like, oh, let me go into the other room, but wait a minute, I need to get my phone and bring it with me. And I'm really trying to break that because there is a degree of slavery involved there. The thing has control over me, and I need to acknowledge what controls my actions so that I can be the boss of it. Um, Some people are enslaved to video games. It's a real addiction. This younger generation is really struggling with it. There was a time when I was a servant to cigarettes and alcohol. You know, it was so ingrained in my behavior that, you know, there was a degree of slavery involved there. I can easily find myself becoming a bond servant to berry pies, even today. I had that in my notes, actually, and she saw it, and she started giggling. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But it's true. You know, you go and walk into the restaurant, and you got the pie section, you're like, ooh, pies. I could easily let that control me and derail me from my goals, my objections, my plans. And I need to be aware of that. We all need to be aware of what out there we make into God's in our life so that we can break away from them and lay them down. So I thought of what else has control over me? And so one of the topics that came up this week was if somebody sneezes, what would you say to them? I grew up saying, bless you. You say, bless you. So the question was presented to me, Why do you say bless you? And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and my answer was, yeah, I don't know. Because we were brought up that way. It was tradition, yeah. 
a little bit more than tradition, and I don't know about the West Coast, but in the East Coast where I grew up, it was an expectation. So if somebody sneezed and you didn't say bless you, why didn't you say bless you? Are you upset with them? Are you wishing ill will on them? What's going on? You know, so <laughs> are you like that? Okay, so yes, that was my understanding too as a child, that when you sneeze, it caused some kind of arrhythmia and the person was susceptible to instantaneous death. And so you would say bless you to them in order to restart their heart or to you know, help them keep going. Uh, I know my wife, when this topic came up, she looked it up and there's you know, older lore about you know, demons and casting of demons during the vulnerability of sneezing or something like that. But the reality is, I couldn't tell you why it was I said it. I was just taught that. You know, and what's even more interesting is we were talking with somebody yesterday who believes in a higher power, but not necessarily in a divine creator. And they say, bless you. And the question was asked to them, when you say, bless you, whose blessing are you asking for? And I don't know that they knew, but it was, you know, I was taught to say it, so we say it. These are the kind of traditions that were taught as kids. I remember being a kid, and when we drove by a graveyard, we would do the cross. I have no idea where that came from. I think I saw my brother do it once or twice, and I'm like, oh, is that what we're doing? Okay, maybe it was because we wanted to make sure that the things buried there stayed there and didn't chase after us, you know. I have no idea, but these things we pick up in our childhood from our ancestors, they can impact our behavior. They can change the way we act. They can become for us the gods of our ancestors. Bad habits, bad traditions, bad customs, good customs, any customs, they can become for us controlling things that we surrender to of our ancestors. And we just need to be aware of that too. I'm not saying they're all bad, but we need to be aware of what traditions passed on to us are controlling us. You know, if, if I'm walking down the street and I'm afraid to step on a crack because I don't want to break my mama's back, you know, and then trying to step over it, I trip and fall, you know, did it benefit anybody really? No. Um, so I just need to be aware of what influences are, are, are coming at me that I'm allowing, that I'm surrendering control to. So the other thing I thought about uh, in, in studying this was, I was curious what religions were going on when this book was written. You know, when, when God was proclaiming to the people to put down the gods, what gods were we talking about? And so if we go to the next slide, please. All right, it's kind of small font, but. So I did the Google which we know has to be correct, right? Um, except I disagree with this information. So this is the seven oldest religions, because I wanted to you know, see the established religions, you know, which ones went back the furthest. <clears throat> so this one is saying that Hinduism is the oldest, which I, I don't agree with these dates at all. And interesting, if you go to the website, which is referenced here, uh, the information on the website doesn't support these dates either. But um, going from uh, back to the top three, uh, Judaism, when you say Judaism was from the 9th to the 5th century, it depends on when you say Judaism started. Do you say it started with Adam and Eve, because that's how far back the book goes? Do you say it was with Abraham? Because Abraham's when the first covenant was established. You know, and so if we, if we talk about Abraham, now we're talking 2,000 years or you know, 20 centuries. Um, if we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant, now you're talking about you know, 1400s, which is still you know, on par with what they think is the oldest. If you look at David, David was about 1,000 BC, and then Joshua was written about 600 BC. So, and BCE, before Common Era, I mean, I still say BC for before Christ, but um, 
So these dates I don't really agree with, but I just wanted to get an understanding of what kind of religions were being dealt with kind of back in that period. Um, Zoroastrianism, I'm sure we're all familiar with that, right? So yeah, nobody is, because this is an ancient Persian religion which was around uh, Iran is where it was established. And there are some still practicing this, I, t I guess, today. But what's interesting about this one is basically the concept is there's a good God, and then there's, and this good God is in a constant battle with an evil spirit. And so you've got this battle of good and evil, which, uh, you know, kind of sounds like, you know, the, the Jewish religion of the day with good and evil. And I have no data to back this up, but I kind of wonder, and they really don't know where it originated from, what the actual date was, but I kind of wonder if the origins go back to, um, I don't know, let's say Joseph was talking to the Pharaoh and translating dreams. And this is one of the other guys that was in there that got kicked out for being wrong. And he hears about this Jewish God, this all-powerful God. You know, and maybe, maybe they copied it along the way and just changed it up a little bit. I don't know. But uh, th it's not really that active today. But Hinduism, I wanted to talk about that because it is pretty active today. Uh, it's, you know, a very large religion. And, and I really didn't know that much about it, so I figured I'd do a little bit of research on it. So in Hinduism, I went to a website, and I have the reference up. But on it, it says... One of the most frequently asked questions about Hinduism is how many gods are there in Hinduism? The most common answer to this question is that there are, anybody want to wager a guess, how many gods in Hinduism? 330 million. Million. It goes on to say, but if you ask anyone to give their names, <laughs> no one would be able to do so. Also, many Hindus do not agree in this number. Some say that there is only one God, while others say that there are 33 gods, and these are all small g gods. Um, the reason behind this confusion is that their own scripture contradicts itself, so they have no idea. Um, so I wanted to read through some of the Hindu gods, and I'm going to avoid calling them by name for the most part, because I don't want to be disrespectful. Um, but they have a trinity of gods. There is Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, one's the creator, one's the preserver, and one's the destroyer. And so they've got a trinity, which is interesting because, you know, we have the original trinity. And then, but if you look at like uh, Greek mythology, you have, you know, uh, Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades. So, the, you know, the Trinity thing kind of gets copied down the road by other religions. And then you have, uh, just naming off a few, there's a goddess of learning uh, who's a patroness of music, art, and speech. There's a goddess of prosperity who's associated with material and non-materialistic wealth, uh, fortune, and beauty. I think it's interesting that beauty and wealth are uh, parallel here. Um, there's a goddess of power, uh, courage, fertility, and beauty. So you have two gods or goddesses that are in charge of beauty. I wonder if there's any like turf wars about that. I don't know. Interesting. Uh, there's a goddess of vegetation, a goddess of children and reproduction, a goddess of snakes and fertility. It seems like an interesting combination. I, when I read that one, I'm like, I wonder if they have a goddess of spiders. And I looked it up, and there was no god of spiders for them. But there are several other, like, you know, um, the Greeks and other religions that have spider gods. And then there's a, a goddess of rain. Um, then there's a goddess of wisdom that removes obstacles. There's a, a major god of war, which means there are minor gods of war, too. And uh, I don't know if you're trying to keep up with me. but um, And then there's a, uh, a god of love. And there's a goddess of love and pleasure. And again, I wonder if there's any turf wars going on there. So it's interesting how there's overlapping in all of these. And these are only just a portion of the 330 million gods that they have. 
And with these cultures, a lot of times people would identify a need, a need that they felt they were powerless to control, like rain, like nature. And so they would identify a God just so they wouldn't feel powerless. And they can say, oh God of rain, bring me rain and I'll honor you. And that way there was a sense of you're contributing to your own destiny. Um, but it's interesting in looking through all of these. Now, I've never, I'm not familiar with any of these gods or goddesses. I've never actively prayed or worshiped to them by name. But I find it interesting that if I'm chasing after prosperity, wealth, fortune, and beauty, does it matter if I'm worshiping that goddess by name? If I'm allowing those things to control me, am I not still worshiping those things? Am I not surrendering myself in pursuit of those things? Don't need to have a name assigned to it. It still controls me. Um, I don't have to worship the goddess of vegetation or even mother nature to allow environmentalism to become a religion for me. And I need to be aware of that. And I think for me, the danger point is if I get to the point, especially with environmentalism, where I think I have more control over the environment than the one that creates and sustains the environment, I've got a real problem. Yeah. So that's when it becomes a religion where I think I'm controlling it. Just like with the pagan gods, you know, I, I want to participate in this, so I'm going to, you know, do what God can't do. Um, and so we need to first identify what are the gods in our lives? What are the idols? What are the things we're bowing down to when we don't even realize we're bowing down to them and surrendering to them? And I think the main difference between, you know, being a good steward of nature and, you know, becoming a religion for us is who do we give the glory to in pursuit of these things? Do we give the glory to God? Do we allow God to establish healthy boundaries in our pursuit for those things? Or do we just commit to them fully, surrendering, enslaving ourselves? We can have all kinds of hobbies that are good and healthy and, and you know, encouraging. But if the hobbies become an obstacle, a veil between us worshiping God and serving God and coming to church and, and you know, sharing the fellowship, when the hobbies take priority over that, we need to honestly ask, is that becoming a religion? Is that replacing what I'm supposed to reserve for Jesus alone in my life. We need to prayerfully seek that and be open about it. Is this a religion? And with that in mind, I just want to jump down to John. We're going to read John 6, uh, just a few verses. And it says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware of his, of, of his disciples, that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is what I told you, that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back to no longer following him. Uh, you do not want to uh, do. Sorry, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, "Lord, 
to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is one of those, you know, these verses are kind of hard to explain, especially to a new believer. I can see these followers saying, you know, Jesus, uh, I've been following you for a while, and you sure do feed us good. I mean, we never are wanting for food. We always have leftovers. Um, you teach some really good lessons. They're eye-opening, they're encouraging, and they're inspiring. Um, but I didn't really sign up for cannibalism. You know, I, I'm, I'm just not sure I thank you, but no. You know, I can see where that, you know, because they didn't understand what he was saying to them. And he even referenced, you know, the manna from heaven. It's important for us to know that when the Israel was in the wilderness and God gave them manna, just like that couple who decided they're only going to eat for nutrition, God said, I will give you what you need, not what you want, not what you desire, not what is pleasurable, endorphin releasing. You know, I'm going to give you what you need, and you just need to accept that and embrace it. And they did, and they grumbled, and, you know, we recently talked about how he sent birds, and then they got tired of the birds too. But when we tie this into the laying down of gods, Jesus is saying, I'm all you need. Fill yourself with me. Quit chasing after variety. Quit chasing after flavors. Quit chasing after these other things. Feed on the words I'm giving you. Feed on the light and the life that comes through me. That's what Jesus is telling them. Put down those other things. You don't need them. You don't need them. Jesus is saying, I'm enough. I'm all you need. So let us try to identify those flavors that we chase after, that we give control to, and lay them down so that we can be more filled with Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what are our takeaways from today? All right. Uh, giving up the gods of our ancestors may likely mean that we give up the superstitions that we were taught. I'm not saying they're bad, just saying don't let them control you. Uh, the next one. That which we allow to control over us, we are worshiping. Next takeaway. You don't have to worship a pagan god by name to be enslaved to the things they represent. Next one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And if you do that, there isn't space left over for these other small g gods. All. Amen. Next one. Amen. The way to salvation is very narrow. Woe to the person that, see, that is seeking variety and options. Amen. There are no other options. And then lastly, Jesus is enough. Yeah. Be filled with him in his ways, forsaking all others. Let's close in prayer. Father God, you, we just praise you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You are enough. Lord, we get so distracted by things and shinies and pleasantries. And, and I'm not saying they're bad, but help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to identify these things that may be perfectly fine for other people, but for us are an idol. And then give us the strength to put it down, to repent of it, to leave it behind. And then whatever void that thing had, that we would fill it with you. Lord, we just pray that you would 
help us all just do a little self-reflection and Lord help us to be still so that we can hear your convictions so that you can help identify the idols and God, small g gods in our life that we can repent and be more like you and closer to you because that is our desire and we just praise you and thank you in Jesus name yes. Amen. Amen and here is your blessing therefore go worshiping the Lord your God and serving him only <laughs>